I'm glad to have you stay with us on TMI this beautiful Thursday morning. Uh, just as I hinted earlier, we're going to be looking at two things. But first, let's uh, uh, talk about education and the quality of it. Uh, a lot of persons have had cause to question the quality of uh, education in Nigeria from elementary to tertiary levels. Is it getting better? Is there something more we can do? Who should be doing that? Government, private sector, parents? What exactly are the specifics we must do to uh, improve on output as far as education in Nigeria is concerned? I'm joined by two gentlemen. I'll begin from my immediate left, Professor uh, Dave Daniel. Uh, he's uh, a lecturer and is also very passionate about issues concerning education. Thank you for coming on the program. Thank you very much. And then next to him is Reverend Canon uh, Thimoti Igodaro. He's a quality uh, assessor, quality assurance assessor, as far as education is concerned, is a strong advocate for uh, technical and vocational uh, education. Those are elements that will definitely make it through to the conversation we're having on the program this morning. Thank you for coming as well. Thank you very much. We appreciate that. I'll begin with you, Prof. Uh, you, 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 you've always talked about issues concerning the weaknesses in our school system. What are some of those things that agitate your mind as far as the school system in this country is concerned? Thank you. Not only in this country, mm. uh, transgenerational, global, we have come to realize that uh, the formal education, in as much as it has its own merit, has suffered some demerits. As far back as the 16th century, Francis Bacon, the intellectual genius, cried out, said people should come out of the churches, they should come out of the schools, and they should inquire truth for themselves. That is not impious to inquire the constellations of the heavens that was Francis Bacon. Then we have people like Rafuato Emerson, mm. who made us understand that those who obey the rules are too weak to think for themselves. Now, here lies formal education in our Formal education, to an extent, is okay in as much as it can help an individual interpret the data in the society and ensure innovations. If you look at societies abroad, you look at America, we compare it, Paris Passu with uh, the United Kingdom, you realize that the education styles in those places are reflected on their society. The United Kingdom is a conservative place. And we find out that the education there is conservative. In America, it's a liberal attitude towards education. I, I'm going to, I'm going to, you're, you're, make, you're establishing a very strong narrative already, which uh, I, I think we have to continue. But we're going to take a quick break right now. So we're back to continue this discussion. Do stay with us. Uh, thank you for staying with us. Uh, would you be kind enough to just continue that narrative? All right. So the United Kingdom conservative attitude towards education as against the American liberal attitude towards education. Why this distinction with the difference? It's simply because these two societies were confronted with different societal problems. The imperialists have always been known to dominate and so they sort of regress to a conservative nature. Unlike the American who is known to fight for his right. And so you had a dynamic society. Now let us come to Nigeria. Formal education, according to a lecture, an inaugural lecture, which read higher level manpower, education, implications, and all that. We realize that to some reasonable extent, formal education has enabled the Nigerian at least to raise his per capita income. Mm. Although it has also attracted what we call some goals. The focal point being income levels has sort of relinquished the very essence of education, which is creativity and all that. The African country, e.g. Nigeria, like from what I can see, is here to confront the very problem besetting her by a educational status and that is exactly what we have in our country I, i'm going to i'm going to narrow it down a little yeah. uh, would, would you say frankly that the 
quality of education we provide in this country does not address the real-time problems we confront as a people? Well, uh, one is tempted to say it is an either year, ne, year nor there issue. But I think the negative weighs more. Take, for instance, in the social sciences, which is deemed to address the cultural dynamics of the society. We realize that a course like economics, the individual is meant to read American economics, British economics, and then is compared to apply the models having learned from those places to his own country, where you have different problems confronting him all together. We call that false paradigm. And that, in no way, has helped the policy of this country. So when the Nigerian tells you, look, the economic problem in Nigeria has defied all policy recommendations, he is actually talking from the perspective of the American models handed over to him. The indigenous innovations models are nowhere. For that reason, we can say that to a fair extent or significantly, the Nigerian education system has not addressed what is in it to her. And that is why it is necessary for there to be a review of the curriculum. But, but talking about the, econo uh, the issue of uh, economics that you yeah. just uh, referred to, Fundamentally, aren't there some economic uh, principles or theories that are universal by way of implications, for example? Well, uh, every science is governed by laws. Mm -hmm. However, in the social sciences, where precision is not the order of the day, such laws could be compromised okay. by the behavioral patterns of the people. We we'll take a look at demand curve, for instance, and then we find out that sometimes you have what they call the pseudo demand curve. Mm. The law of downward sloping demand curve does not apply when the price and the demand become what correlated. Then we also look at the use of the stock market in predicting the economic dynamics. In America, because of the well developed stock market, it is feasible. But in Nigeria, it is not. Therefore, you cannot bring what holds in America to Nigeria. Now, the Nigerian should sit back and ask himself, what can I do to put this society in order? That is the best form of education. So long as we still think that formal education will yield the meal ticket that the Nigerian aspires for, there will still be problems of unemployment, there will still be high rate of crime. But if we come to a point of enlightenment, as the Americans have come to, recall that the relative percentage of postgraduate pro uh, students in Nigeria is higher than America. Why is it so? It is simply because the American has come to know that, look, if I put my hand on this, on that, and I bring out my innate skills, to bear on society, and I can just meet the gap between A and B, I will be patronized. But the Nigerian man still thinks, until I hold a degree in this field, I will never be outstanding. But that, that's a systemic problem, isn't it? It's not a problem of the person who decides to go earn a degree or two, but it's, it's what the system it's here a systemic demands. Pro, pro, you know, it's a systemic problem yes. that is well emphasized in the African culture. Mm. Yeah, it's a systemic problem that is well emphasized in the African culture. Sometimes when we talk about people like Bill Gates, we shout, wow, it's an American stuff. There are better Bill Gates here in Nigeria. Until Philip Semegwili went to America, we saw, thought him mad when he was in Ondo State. He was not embraced for his ideas. Because as at the time people had not known what the other cause was in Nigeria, Phillips was already romanticizing with computers. 
Bill Gates went to Harvard, I think, to study computer science of mathematics. And when he could not just conform with the formalities of classes, he left the classroom to start romanticizing with his hobbies, computers. And today we have the Microsoft Word. Now, how do you measure the person of Bill Gates? Would you refer to him as a professor or as an illiterate? If you have to do a research on Microsoft, Bill Gates is the authority there. Now, the values we attach to certain things must be compromised. I'm not saying that we should do away with formal education, no. I've not said so. But I'm only saying that it's only a path to the destination. It is not the destination itself. We're going to talk about destination as we wind down on the program. But let oh, me come to uh, Reverend Kano Yagodara quickly. He, he has made um, sort of succinct reference to the issue of model, education model. What exactly is the model we're using in Nigeria, for example? I mean, how has that changed the narrative for the better? Because there's always a question mark over policy, over model, and so on and so forth. It will appear we are having a conversation that's actually leading nowhere in, in practical terms. <clears throat> um, as we are discussing, you see, the educational system mm. of a given society must reflect that social system. Okay. It is the force that is propelling it and may be conceived as the most powerful means of social control. How does he achieve this? Because he stays with regulation. Mm. If anything follow the path and processes of production, if you stick to regulations and law guiding the production process, you are going to have a good quality product. But where you deviate from the processes, from the legislation, from the law, your product will be cheaper to produce, but you will have an inferior product. Now, our educational system, the way it is being prepared, particularly after the, the, the imperialists left, giving us what I call colonial education of grammar, English, philosophy, Latin, classic, so that we can be able to interpret for the Englishman, for their commodity product. When they left, those people who became, who took over administration, are the very beneficiary of this educational, colonial educational process. Therefore, it continues. They now have their children. They now have their grandchildren. They continue in this line of grammar school, secondary grammar school, that aspect of it. Now, as these schools were growing, population was increasing. There was the need to provide infrastructure. There was the need to provide, when I mean infrastructure, both material and human, mm. so that you were able to drive this process. What now happens? Every aspect of the Nigerian uh, region started going wide apart. There is no longer a correlation between society, societal requirement and educational process. When you are developing a curriculum, you do not invite the society. What do you want? Where are we now? So that our, our, our curriculum will reflect our present system. So therefore, you will discover that if there is correlation between the society and the educational system, is the society that we fund the educational system. Is the society that will benefit from the product of the educational system. You see they are in Paru Paso. They are growing at each other. The society informed the educational system. This is what we want now. This area will lack manpower. It will provide a fund. The educational system will change its curriculum to be able to address the area where manpower is lacked. And they will produce high quality manpower effective workforce that will be produced, mobile workforce, an efficient workforce that will be able to drive the process of quality production. So when we are talking of quality, we mean a process that is gliding towards excellence, a process of exception, fit for purpose, transformative value for money. This is what we call quality. So education over the years, a quality has been the challenge. 
education. Bebe, why is it becoming so, I mean, increasingly difficult to address yes. that gap that yes, the I'm, absence I'm of quality creates? Yes, I'm coming. Mm. Now, I was a staff of NAPTEP. Okay. I rose to the position of a deputy director and head of unit, National Ski Qualification Framework. Now, in Britain, in 1986, they discovered that the way their educational system was going, it can no longer produce anything for them. Graduates of school are not productive. They are not employable. They now institute what we call national vocational qualification. That is, if you are following the path of secondary grammar school, and somebody is following the path of the technical colleges, they should be treated paru in the same level. No disparity. Yeah, no disparity in the same level. They also discovered that those people from the grammar school, from the university, when you graduate, for instance, child care, early childhood, I'm talking of education now, right. from faculty of education, mm. BSc, early childhood, that is not enough for you to take employment. Okay. You have only had what we call academic qualification. And in an academic qualification, 70 over 100 is distinction, is A, in some schools. Mm -hmm. 80 is A. But in national vocational qualification, 99%, you are not competent. It's got to be 100. Yes, 100%. Mm. So why do they come to do that? They now organize themselves. We call them sector ski councils. Every sector of the economy, oil, gas, uh, construction, mechanical, all of them had their sector state council. They began to develop what we call National Occupational Standard, NOS. As they develop it, they develop it at various levels. In Britain, it is level one, level two, level three, level four to level eight. In Nigeria, it is level one, level two, up to level six. Now, there are qualifications for you to enter into this level. This qualification does not mean that you have this level. You are to go for training. Mm. The training will be driven by you if you make yourself available at all times because they are guided learning hours. So if you have a degree now in, in a early childhood, we know that you have some material upstairs regarding childhood. So when you are going to start, you are going to start in level three. Level three. So there are national occupation standards. There are code of practice. There are code of conduct already developed for this industry. This national occupation standard is not static. <coughs> it's different from the curriculum. It is also changing. As new ways of doing things emerges, as cheaper ways of doing things emerges, the national occupation standard will change. New things will be incubated. Other things will be deleted so that the society can move forward. So when a graduate is as a teacher and you are handing KG1, kindergarten, and you are taking them out, either indoor games or outdoor games, there are processes and procedures you need to follow. So, but in, in the university, nobody is teaching that. They are teaching the concept of early childhood. So you have to come back and be trained. You have to register with a training center. When you register with this training center, this training center we, are, I, we, we now register you with an awarding organization who is going to award your certificate. That awarding organization is responsible for ensuring what we call external quality assurance. That quality is being applied. In the training institute, you have what we call the quality assurance assessor, who himself is also occupationally competent, who himself is undergoing a or, uh, every process available for continuous professional development. Uh, let, let, me, let me bump in okay. on you quickly. These whole issues that you're raising, as important as they are, also give an impression that the process itself will be rigorous, as you talk about Britain, for yes. example. Isn't that perceived rigorous process a, a reason we, government especially, probably feels uh, overwhelmed? No, mm. it is not. As I was telling you, over the years, NAPTEB is the only examination body that have jailed somebody for exam and practice. Nobody has done so. Mm. When NAPTEB now came to a situation 
where we have to define again examination malpractice. The examination malpractice does not mean when students copy in the exam. Or, or, or brings extraneous materials. It does not. Mm. Anybody who is supposed to provide a chair in which 1.2 meters each apart when people sit down, and you now provide a table which is less than one meter apart, mm. and examination malpractice take place. The person who supplied those bench have encouraged exam practice. And they are culpable. Yes. So therefore, the Ministry of Education can be culpable for exam practice. When the material for examination, you fail to provide it. When the conducive environment that will not encourage exam practice, you fail to provide it. You have committed exam practice. All of these are supposed to be factors in an ideal environment, ideal yes. situation. Because but, but we don't have an ideal situation. We, we are supposed to have, because people don't we follow regulation. Yes, mm. this is what I'm saying. If you do not follow regulation, you don't have quality product. The law says that the benches that the student will write their exam in the hall, mm. the one, the, from the chest of one learner to the chest of the second uh, learner, that, that would be what we use in a vocational assessment. Right must be 1.5 meters apart. I, I, I can almost assure you over the top of my head that this is the first time a lot of persons watching right now are hearing what you're saying now. Yeah. They never knew it was there. Yeah. But, but you already made an allusion to the issue of exam malpractice. Yes. You and I, we had something close to lunch yesterday and you yeah. talked extensively about malpractice. Mm -hmm. To what extent is that damaging the fabric of our educational system? Well, it is all pervading. It's all over the place. Mm. Uh, the first, let us see why a student should even involve his or herself in my practice. Uh, formal education, as good as we want to paint it, has its own itches. Uh, we'll take a look at the person of uh, Albert Einstein who was initially referred to as ineducatively stupid. Rather than going through that formal path, the mother called him, taught him, until he was strengthened enough to veer in there. And we know he, was, he became one of the most renowned professors. Now, when the purpose of a thing is not known, abuse becomes inevitable. The truth is, if the passion of education is sold out to the student, the student will be married to his books. I mean, it's interesting to read. Mm -hmm. I don't know what people enjoy without reading. So, this whole issue of bad practice is also a subset of that same systemic problem we earlier addressed. This is the only way we can grow. This is the only way I can end. So it becomes a cutthroat phenomenon. It's a do or die affair. If I do not pass, I will not get a good job. And in Nigeria, if you don't have a degree, you will not, you don't stand the opportunity of being there. The individual has not yet been introduced to his potential. He has not come to realize that with or without that, he can aspire to the highest level in life. And that is why he sees it as a do or die affair. If you go to America, the lady tells you, look, I'm not for academics because I don't have the brains. I'm in for this or that. If he's a farmer or she's a farmer, she tells you, farmer joy. And she is respected that way. Now, the high premium placed on certification is the problem the Nigerian man has. Is, is he misplaced? is misplaced. Mm. That premium placed on certification is misplaced. Now, let us reflect on what transpired in the Second World War. Was it America or Germany? When there was hate, the government realized that there were people who were not formally trained, but they had this passion for reading. And before that war, they already made provisions for such people. Now, when the library was bombed, such persons were invited. What do we do? They began to consult human libraries where the formerly educated people failed. Now, if the Nigerian knows that with this knowledge, I can make impact, he does not need to go into my practice. As a matter of fact, a student who sees it as something to lobby for 
we end up becoming a professor who will train other students that and of course if you've gone through that mere process of collecting bribes to rise what do you do you also collect bribes from other people that are coming up so it is a problem as it were it is a problem is it possible to break that cycle uh, the truth yeah of course it is possible to break that cycle but it's not going to start from the education sector alone the attitudinal effects of the people must be altered education must now be properly defined for what it is you know i told you we had a problem defining what the formal education really is yesterday mm. and i said what we call formal education today may be best seen as conventional education are we going to go conventional which means we have to absorb around the regulations and i want to say here that whatever law or regulation we absorb about is something that should fit in with the current dynamic of our society mm. let us don't say we must obey rules because of the rule sake what are those rules tending us to the revolutionary trend in american society came to a point where people like Revado emerson milton friedman they even began to refute unionisms and all those other things that will ensure regulations because they saw that the regulations were not taking them anywhere emerson said those who conform to the rules are too, are too weak to think for themselves milton friedman made this observation in capitalism and freedom the nobel laureate he said the advances in different sciences have actually been done by the potsherds and quacks in those sciences and history is replete with such people so to address the issue of my practice let us come back to ask is education really necessary to improve income levels in our society if it is necessary then why is there vast unemployment great unemployment in the country it is after we've addressed these issues that the man who is called for academics we sit down as a matter of fact was it not about instinct that said the man of science is indeed a poor philosopher the man of knowledge does not consider wealth as the immediate gain yeah he is a slave to knowledge he's a slave to a society what is happening in anambra state oh he goes into his data into his laboratory his library and begins to plot his course to see what to tell the nation mm. is not a man who has been awarded professorship the next thing we see him inside a restaurant drinking beer and all those other things repeating one project or the other things that have no relevance and these are the problems we have so we must begin to ask ourselves we must begin to tell the people the nigerians that for what you are skilled for please come up we want us to know what you can do we are it not for the liberal approach america gave to the likes of bill gates they would have been silenced forever you, you have made continuous reference to bill gates yeah. let's talk about him for a minute mm -hmm. okay. bill gates broke through in the 20th century mm -hmm. and some persons would rather argue that this is the 21st century mm -hmm. and it comes with peculiar realities that people have to grapple with do you share that uh, sentiment at all <laughs> what about a man facebook the facebook man he also broke through in the 21st century history is dotted with men of innovations francis bacon i mentioned in the 16th century was a man that was highly certified but it came to a point where he realized that he was static in mind and began to advocate that people should come out from the churches come out from the mosques and come out from the schools and find truth for themselves it is one thing for you to be certified it's another thing for you to begin to inquire truth for yourself and the truth is man being a dynamic being the society being dynamic mm -hmm. those regulations cannot really help to ascertain truth to some extent you know it could be it could help in regulating practices but to what extent do we emphasize them hopefully we can find answers to uh, some of these questions as we continue mm -hmm. this discussion let me come back to you now again uh, reverend uh, a lot of persons have talked about how that we also need to uh, as it were interrogate 
the competence or otherwise of those who are practitioners in the school system, within the school system, that's in the education sector. Yeah. I'm very sure you were in this state, for example, uh, a few years ago, when we had uh, an exercise that eventually turned out controversial, which was the so-called competency test. Yes, government at the time said it was the way to go. It was timely. It was important. That was done. Yeah. But eventually, as I said, it became controversial. And then we had a similar instance play out uh, in Cardona State in 2017. Does that put a question mark on the competence, the capability, capacity of teachers or otherwise? Uh, yes, I want to talk to you very much. You see, as at that time we were speaking, when that competency test came in Edo State, mm. I, was, I was already a quality assurance assessor okay. in London, internal quality assurance manager London. We determine competency. And I told them that the process you are adopting to determine competency is null and void. Because question and answer cannot determine competency. You see, in vocational assessment, those people must be sent for training. Then, then they will be assessed. Based but, on the training? Yes. No, generally, what, the job they are scheduled, mm. you'll be trained along that level. Okay. And then you'll be assessed by a qualified assurance assessor that is occupationally competent in that field. Mm. We assess you. And for you to determine competency, to generate evidence, you have three different assessment methods that will generate one evidence. So you cannot just come around and say question and answer. No. Question and answer is an assessment method. Direct observation is an assessment method. Professional discussion is an assessment method. Personal statement is an assessment method. Learning journal is an assessment method. There are about seven or eight that you need to be blown. And this assessment method must be made available to all the learners. So as far as you have not done that, you cannot determine competency. Because one, I'm going to ask you, who is going to internally assure it? Quality assure it. And who is going to externally quality assure it? Your this must be on the ground. May have taken years over practice to be able to get that external quality assurance. It is a, is a tedious place. Mm. Last training we, I had in Abuja, I had so many PhD uh, orders who were my learners. We call them learners in vocational assessment. They want to be able to assess the area of their training. They are occupationally competent, but they are not quality assurance assessors. We need to train them as quality assurance assessors so that they can quality assure the process of their training of their own students when they come for training for competency exam. So you have it like this, not competent, not yet competent, or competent, not yet competent. That's it too. Even if you have 99, that's what we call sufficiency. If you have 99 over 100, it's not sufficient. It must be authentic. That is, must be the learner's own work. It must be current. We are not talking of uh, uh, 18th century. It must be current. So currency is also an important factor in assessment. As it, 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 is vocational education the answer to the question our discussion is asking right now? Yeah, it is, but there is an aspect of it. Okay. Moral behavior. I'm working on that moral behavior, moral content in assessment. Where assessment does not have moral content, then it's going to yield a divert expected behavior. It's going to produce low quality. It won't capture what it's supposed to capture because they, you deviate from the process and procedure for ensuring quality. i give you an example. You look at this. Some years ago, the Nigerian people came together that government have no business downstream sector of the, of the oil economy. Mm. They have shares in Mobi. They have shares in Ajib. They have shares in Tesaco. The federal government sold them. Government have no business in all those areas. They privatized them. What not happened? Federal government came back building mega station. Are we not turned around? You know why? That thing they were saying is correct. But those people they sold those things to do not have the love of this country. So for every economic process he, uh, the professor enumerated, there is a moral content. Where that moral content is lacking, then you, don't, you won't get the expected behavior. You won't get the expected outcome. That is why Nigeria came by building mega stations all over the country. Are we not back to downstream sector again, which we earlier said we are not? People at that time connived in order to take that business from government. They are incorporated into their system. What did they do? 
they lock their tap. Say, you come knee crawling to me now. You have money. You cannot buy petrol. They made money for themselves. Government now quickly turned around to start building mega stations. And today you are aware that those mega stations, they elevated the suffering of the people, even though it is not at the expected level. But we agree. So that is what we are saying now. Now let's come to our education, our educational system. Have you seen a dog before? A dog normally wags his tail. I don't understand me. But today in our educational system, the tail is wagging the dog. That's what we are seeing now. Isn't that an obvious aberration? It is. It is. It is. It is. It's not expected. Because if you have a PhD, first class, in your first degree, you have a PhD, it's not enough for you to teach without moral behavior. That's true. That's true. That is why people come to a lecturer, you talk of... Uh, uh, Sex for marks. Uh, yes. Mm -hmm. Now, let me give you my experience. In Lagos, I took some, we call, whether you have a PhD, we call them learner. People who have come for training, mm. we call them learners. We, I took them out for practical work, we, for construction. We are on the feed. To get their learner, they are going to assess based on the national occupation standard. Okay. So you develop units from them. Each qualification has its own unit. You develop. Health and safety is there. Teamwork is there. Communication is there. All these are what we call mandatory units. I took them out. After we are finished, they came back. To the, we are coming back to our hotel. We decided to eat in a restaurant. After we are finished eating in the restaurant, I went to wash my hand. When I came back, I wanted to pay. They told me one of those learners has paid. So I now called them and said, well, you don't have to do that. I'm supposed to pay. I'm the one who took you people out. They said, don't. The next thing they brought an envelope and said, take. I said, I will not. I don't do that. Do you know that this learner did not return to me again? They returned to another person. Why was it? This one that will not take money from any person. He will be very strict. So apparently you suspected you were probably being compromised. Exactly. Mm. And I resisted it. So when I when in NAPTEP, when we after a practical examination, I've told the teachers, when I address them in Edo State, that some of you will send you out for practical examination. You go there and collect money without doing that. NAPTEP over the year have been fighting this Kanka one. What did she now develop? When we go to a school, we say, we are at the relics of the exam. You are expected to make chairs or tables or produce uh, spanners in the, using late machine and all that. If there are 50 students in this school, we want to see them because we have our specification. So when we cannot find them, we know they have a compromise mm. and we cancel that exam. Altogether? Yes, for that practical exam. And without that practical exam, the students are finished. Then the students now knew that there is no way. They have to follow regulation. These are what we are seeing. Now, those staff are ad hoc staff. They are no NAPTEF staff. So NAPTEF cannot have his staff to go around the country. So she's fighting this Kanka one to make sure that her exam is quality assured. Now I want to give you an example. The federal technical, all technical colleges in Nigeria, we discover that they don't have a feeder a school. Like primary school, we feed secondary school. Do you understand me? Mm -hmm. Who feed the technical college? None. We have to open up a uh, common entrance uh, come and begin to do advertisement. So they now said they should be another lower arm of each technical college. That means technical college is vocational one, vocational two, and vocational three. But we now said, let us have a junior arm. Do you know the name they gave that junior arm? They call it junior secondary school. How can you call it junior secondary school inside the technical college? We insisted that it's supposed to be pre-vocational one, pre-vocational two, pre-vocational three. Then you enter vocational one, vocational two, then vocational three, and you graduate with national technical certificate just or national business certificate. Just like you have with the regular secondary school. Exactly. Mm. Now, after they have succeeded in doing that, they now said, no, these technical colleges should not just be called federal uh, technical colleges or government technical college for the state. It should be called federal science and technical college, government science and technical college. Then we now ask them, what is the science they are, you are now teaching that hitherto was not being taught when it was Federal Technical College? Mm -hmm. If you are taking carpentry in, in any of the technical colleges, you must take physics, you must take chemistry, you must take mathematics, you must take English, you must take literature because of a, of a technical report writing. You must take these ones. Those ones. Then before you come and take drawing, take carpentry, take joinery, and then woodwork. The wood technology. 
All these things are combined together to make you competent, both in the sciences and the technical aspect. All these are there. Now you have changed it to federal science and technical college. What science are you going to teach now that will not be taught? They could not tell us. You know what they did? They now have a secondary arm. Mm. They call it senior secondary science. So that those, uh, 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 those in the GSS one are tailored into secondary school. I say, don't federal government have a unity schools? Don't they teach sciences there? Why should it be now the few technical college, one per state that we have, and some state don't have, that you now bring in this? What they have succeeded, they have destroyed the technical colleges. All these learners are now facing senior secondary school. Neko and Waiak are the ones conducting the exam instead of NAPTEP. The law that established NAPTEP that you should conduct common entrance into all the technical colleges in Nigeria. Mm. But today, NECO is conducting common entrance into the technical colleges, which is an aberration that should be challenged and made suspect. Its fundamental conception must be challenged. This cannot con continue. If we keep quiet, this thing will continue to go down. Yeah, I, I hope we'll find the, we find the will and the... the there is a way. I'm yeah, coming. Please, I, let me... I, I hope we find the will yeah, to do that. Yes, I, I was going to... I, I'm going to come back to you for a minute before okay. we we'll wrap it up. I mean, this whole thing is becoming very complicated by the day. It, it will appear just uh, rejigging the policy framework as it were, doing a review of it altogether, and even increasing funding substantially uh, just will not be enough to answer the questions about the dysfunction in our school system. Is that what you think? Well, in a small child there is an economic playhouse. Mm. I think so. Uh, he just talked about the wealth of the nation being in the hands of few people. We are sometimes inclined to think that the Nigerian economic system is liberalization and privatization, or is tending towards that. But a second thought will make us believe that it's plutocracy, that is, an economic system that is controlled by the rich. Now, whenever few people mm hold the wealth of the nation. If there is no even spread, policies will never favor the masses. That is an established truth by Adam Smith, by this other man, a great uh, psychologist. So, we realize a fundamental fact that the restoration, or perhaps the renovation we are talking about, is not going to start within that educational system in the first place. The people who abused the NAPTEC procedures for exams and all that, we are not the people in the education system itself. They were people in politics, people who had power, people who had the wealth of the country as it were. Now, if we all have equal votes, when I mean equal vote, equal Naira vote, mm. in economic terms now, right. we'll be able to put a step to one or two things going on. Look, these things should not continue this way. This is what it should be. But as it were, everyone is a price taker. Almost everyone is a price taker in Nigeria. They've said it, let us follow suit. And do not forget that survival is a basic instinct. The man who should speak is hungry and there are few people that can actually reject you know envelopes like our brother here did the truth is the rule is a lot of people will accept because he does not know when next will be paid his salary so these are factors that we have to look into but then what we must not ask ourselves is why should an exam that should be conducted by examination body be taken over by the others is it because the students were afraid of going through that methodological process of NAPTEC that they had to go to NECO? And these are the issues that the policy makers and holders must, a, must, must address. Must address. Mm. Yes, they, these are issues that they must address. But that the economy and the social dynamics of the society impinge on the educational sector, bringing some compromise is something that we can never escape. So if we are addressing the educational sector, mm. let us don't say Ministry of Education. Rather, 
we should begin to look at the political settings and how it affects and how it affects yeah, those people. I'm not saying that Ministry of Education does not have its own role to play. It it's a ministry. It does. Mm -hmm. But the leadership, leadership, then the nature of society, which in this case is plutocracy, and plutocracy goes very close to socialism. And where you have socialism, you are talking about somebody enjoying what it does not earn. So there is corruption. So the moral attitudes and moral obligations are not well fixed. It is for that reason we must now begin to define our economic and socioeconomic policies to fit or bear on our educational curriculum. All right, great. Uh, let me give uh, Reverend one minute to yeah. wrap up. Uh, if you look at it, leadership, mm. leadership in educational sector need to improve a lot force on government, because it's government that makes the law. Right. It's government that promotes the law. It's government that will enforce the law, though we have aspect to, to enforce the law mm. in our own capacity. So, for instance now, since February last year, the National Ski Qualification Framework was flagged up by the Minister of Education. Up to now, there's no legislation. If another client takes two weeks, and the legislation is out. But in our case, we're looking at more than one year down the line. Well, that, nothing, nothing's been done. Mm. We are operating today based on the approval of the Federal Executive Council during the time of uh, 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 President Jonathan, which uh, President Mwamba Buhari also approved, PNB also approved, that we should continue to carry on. But nobody has sent a B to the National Assembly that you should do this. Let any professor in Nigeria come and challenge me that if he goes to London as an engineer and he wants to practice engineering, whether he will not be subjected to MBQ. Even if he has been a professor for 25 years. For 20 years. something years. They mm -hmm. don't, you must do national vocational qualification. And he will start from level three out of eight levels. As a professor. As a professor. He will start from level three. Even to the meat seller in the market, he's occupationally competent. He has his MVQ. Without MVQ, they have started adopting Nigeria. If you go to LNG, I've been there where we went to go and look at their school, the quality of the school, they have a training school there. If you don't have MVQ, they won't employ you there. So people are now moving from Nigeria now to South Africa to train. Most of the staff I met, they are from South Africa. I told them I'm from London, where I was trained. So I'm occupationally competent in my own area. So what I'm trying to tell you, government has a role to play. Individuals have a role to play. Moral content of assessment will be ensured that there, you must be morally uh, reliable for you to conduct assessment. Because if you conduct assessment, you will tamper with it if you, if, if you are persuaded to do so. Mm. But when you are persuaded to tamper with it, you refuse because of the moral value. I, I, moral, but let me end finally. Yes. If you look at the taxonomy of educational objective, mm. in the affective domain, character is at the level. It's the highest level in the mm -hmm. affective domain. What is affective domain? Our thinking our emotion, our disposition, our spiritual aspect of, of life. Conscience. That Conscience. determines everything. Mm. That determines where you go. That determines your sources. Mm. So when the moral, when the character is failing, what is character? Nothing distinguish one man from another as character. Men may differ in academics, in the social status, economic achievement, but none of these things distinguish one man from another as character. Okay. So moral behavior must be stressed mm. in all aspects of our life, in governance, in leadership, in all the sector. Moral behavior. And we, we, we hope we're able to put all of this in place and uh, ultimately make uh, character uh, an issue of prominence for us as a people and of course as uh, government. I want to talk especially to gentlemen, uh, Professor David Daniel, uh, for coming on the program. We Thank appreciate you your time much. and your expertise you brought on yeah. this discussion this morning. Also, Reverend Canon Timothy Godaro is a quality assurance assessor, London trained, a proud Nigerian. Thank you so much as well for coming to the program. We Thank appreciate you. that.